Welcome to our first video on hyperbolic paraboloid vaults. This is from chapter 8, section 2, subsection 2, and it's labeled with an A, which indicates that it is the first in a series of videos on this topic. In this video, we will show how a hyperbolic paraboloid can be generated by sweeping a par parabola along a parabolic path. In subsequent videos, we will show how to generate a hyperbolic paraboloid using an equation, and then how to generate a hyperbolic paraboloid using geometric directrices. Along the way, we will talk about the various situations in which each of these generative te techniques is the most practical. In a previous video, we talked about roll-through deformation of a simple barrel vault and a variety of ways of stiffening the barrel vault with ribs set edge-on to the barrel vault shell. Adding double curvature to the vault, i.e. giving it a saddle shape, can also enhance its structural performance compared to the simple barrel vault. On the left in this image is a simple barrel vault. On the right is a particular kind of saddle surface called a hyperbolic paraboloid. Compared to the simple vault, the hyperbolic paraboloid vault has greater structural depth relative to the bending processes associated with roll-through deformation. Just to make sure that you have a sense of the difference of these, uh, this is the multi-frame file in which they were generated. So right here we have a simple barrel vault. It's not articulated with any more depth than the depth of these arch elements that uh, comprise it. On this side we have a variety of depths or rises to the arch elements which produces this sort of curved cross-section. In a sense, the structural depth of this barrel vault in resisting roll through buckling is just the depth of each of these arch elements. But the depth of this hyperbolic paraboloid in resisting roll through is the difference between the location of this point and these two points, which are offset in that direction. So it is our expectation, if we have a proper shear transfer across this network, that this hyperbolic paraboloid will be much stiffer and stronger in resisting roll-through effects. The hyperbolic paraboloid shape can be generated in multiple ways. One of those methods is to start with a single parabola governed by the equation y equals minus kx squared. So in this case, y is the vertical and x is to the right. This is contrary to most CAD programs, but it is the standard in structural analysis programs, which began with simple two-dimensional analysis in the xy plane, and when it was expanded to three dimensions, the perpendicular dimension was labeled Z. So this is what this parabola looks like in a three-dimensional view. Um, X def and Y define the plane in which the parabola exists, and the parabola is Y equals minus KX squared, and then the dimension perpendicular to that plane is labeled with a Z. This initial parabola can be duplicated through a 90 degree angle to produce a second parabola with the equation y equals minus kz squared. So this is the parabola y equals minus kz squared. This is the original parabola y equals minus kx squared. This parabola y equals minus kz squared can be mirrored about the y equals zero point in other words, we can flip it upward, and then it looks like this, and the new equation that governs that is y is equal to plus kz squared. 
So we sometimes say this parabola opens upward, this parabola opens downward. Now, the coordinates for those parabolas were actually generated in Excel and then input to multi-frame. And in the spreadsheet that was created, um, we describe the depth that we want the hyperbolic paraboloid to have. We describe what span we want it to have. So in this case, the number 16, which is the depth we've chosen of 16 feet, is put in in bold blue, meaning that that was an input variable that we can change anytime we want to. Uh, likewise, the span can be changed and the number of bays. The width of the bay is determined once we know what the span is. And then we divide that by the number of bays that gives us the width of an individual bay. Now here we have the z-coordinates in this column. And here we have the x-coordinates. And in between we have y as determined by the formula y is equal to plus kz squared. And here we have y is equal to minus kx squared. Now these formulas were worked out in previous uh, videos dealing with arches, so we won't go through them in much detail. We will point out though that the, the most negative value of z is going to be half of 64, which is the total span. And then the next point is going to be that previous point plus this dimension right here, the size of a bay. So the bay is four feet, and if we started at z equals minus 32, the next point will be z equals minus 28, then z equals minus 24, and so forth. And we have a similar arithmetic for the x-coordinates. Now, when we do this calculation, we want to, when, when uh, k is equal to l over 2, excuse me, when z is equal to l over 2, we want y to be equal to the depth. So this constant of proportionality is just going to be the depth divided by l over 2 squared. So if we put z equals to l over 2 and square it, that cancels this out and y is just equal to the depth, which of course is what we want it to be. So at minus 32 feet, the formula y equals kz squared gives plus 16. That goes down to 0 when z is equal to 0, and then it goes back up to 16 again when z is equal to the other extreme value of 32 feet. In the case of the y equals minus kx squared at x equal to its extreme negative value, which is minus 32 feet, uh, the value of y is minus 16 feet. It goes up to 0 feet when x is equal to 0, and then it goes back down to minus 16 feet at the other extreme end of the x values, which is x equals plus 32. So just to show you how this works, I can plug in a 12 right here, and you'll notice that all the y values change. Uh, so that the extreme values of y are 12 feet instead of the original 16. And I can go through and change any of these variables that I want to, but that's not the primary point of this lesson. So, we're going to go back here and make the point that our original parabola was produced using the coordinates that are surrounded in red. So, in order to uh, demonstrate how this whole development was done. I'm going to open up multi-frame and we're going to plug some coordinates into multi-frame and generate uh, that parabola. So we, here we have a fresh multi-frame file. We're going to come up here and we're going to pick this thing that says beam generator and we click on that and we know we have 16 bays so we're going to type 16 in here which will give us 16 segments connected together 
and to uh, simplify things so we don't have a bunch of restraints all over the place we're just going to put no restraints there and initially we're not going to worry about the dimensions of any of these things they will come in uh, with some arbitrary default value that the program decides on and we're not particularly interested because we're going to go immediately to the data window and you'll notice in this window we've got X, Y, and Z and we have 17 nodes uh, corresponding to 16 members. So in a sense you can think of the members as spaces between the nodes and there have to be 17 nodes to have 16 spaces. So now we can go in and we can manipulate any of this data in here and we're going to do that by going to Excel and we're going to highlight these X and Y values. So I'm going to say copy and then I'm going to go back to multi-frame and I'm going to highlight all the X and Y values here and I'm going to hit paste. And now I can go back to my frame window and I'll say show me everything and that's the parabola that we've been looking at where Y is up and X is to the right and again we can go look at that in three dimensions if we want to and it looks like this and now I'm going to lasso all of that and rather than go generate the uh, y equals plus k z squared parabola in multi in Excel I'm just going to use the tools that exist in multi-frame so I'm going to go duplicate this and I'm going to do it cylindrically and I'm going to duplicate it through 90 degrees and I get this and now I'm going to go mirror that uh, about Y and in this case I don't want to duplicate it I just want to take that one element and uh, and um, flip it upwards or mirror it through Y equals zero so I'm not going to click the duplicate here and I now have uh, those two parabolas. Now I want to show how those things can be replicated down. In order to do that I'm going to go back to my Excel spreadsheet and I'm going to focus on this data right here. What I have right now is I have this parabola poised on top of this parabola where they both meet at x equals zero and z equals zero. Uh, and y equals zero. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to uh, duplicate it. So I'm going to take this data right here. I've got 4 and minus 1.25 for x on this parabola. So I'm going to duplicate this parabola which is the one that opens upward. I'm going to duplicate it 4 units or 4 feet in the x direction and move it downward by one quarter of a foot in the y direction. So I'm starting the process of sweeping this parabola, the one that opens upward, down the one that opens downward. So I'm going to sweep this around where it's easy to select. And I'm going to select this and I'm going to say duplicate and now I'm going to duplicate in a linear way and I'm going to take it 4 and minus 0.25 which will now transport it down to that point. Now I could take that one and duplicate it down again but I'd have to figure out what the y value is that I have to displace it. So what's easier is to just take this and now I'm going to go back to um, my spreadsheet and I see the next point is 8 and minus 1. So now I'll go back to multi-frame and I will say duplicate and I'm going to go 8 and minus 1 and now I'm going to lasso this same one again and go back to my spreadsheet and it says I need to go 12 out and minus 2.25 so I'm going to go duplicate 
12 feet out minus 2.25 and I'll say OK. And we'll do one more of these. So we got to go 16 in the x direction and minus 4 in the y direction. So I'm going to go lasso this. Say duplicate. And I'm going 16 and minus 4. And just to make sure that I'm generally on track here, I'm going to rotate this around and I see that I am landing every time on an appropriate point on the parabola along which I'm sweeping, which is the y equals minus kx squared parabola. So we can continue this process until we get down to the last point here and I'm just going to go through that and complete that process. When we complete that process, it looks like the following. And now what we're going to do is we're going to swing around here. And actually I think what we'll do is we'll select all. Then we're going to swing around and deselect this one. And now we're going to take all of these and we're going to mirror them. So we pick mirror about, in this case, x equals zero. In this say, time, we do want to duplicate when we mirror because we want to keep the original ones. And so now we have an image that looks like this. Now we can re return to our spreadsheet and we can begin to sweep our original parabola y equals minus kx squared up this parabola to generate the rest of the surface. Now we could do this just by snapping a bunch of points together. In other words, I could come into multi-frame and it has a feature that allows me to say, okay, I got to this point. Now I'm just going to snap a bunch of points here. And I need to uh, zoom in a little closer in order to make this work. And I might want to tilt it back a little bit more to avoid some of the confusion. But I could snap all these points. But this process would probably be more laborious than just duplicating the parabola upwards. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to quit there and I'm going to come and take this parabola and I'm going to highlight it and then I'm going to duplicate it. And I'm now going to duplicate it up to this level. So I want to go look at my coordinates uh, here, I want to go 8 and 1. 8 in the Z direction, or actually minus 8 because I started walking up in that direction. So I'm going to go minus 8 and plus 1. So I go back here and I say duplicate. And I'm going to say 0 for X, minus 8 for z and 1 for y and I get that. Now I can continue this process up. I'll do one more. So I'm going to go lasso this and then I'm going to go find my coordinates. So it would be, whoops, Twelve and two point two five. I'll go back here and I'm going to say duplicate minus twelve for z and two 
0.25 for y and I'll do that. We can continue this process until we've generated all of these parabolas after which we arrive at this form. So basically we have swept this original parabola right here up to each one of these points on the parabola that opens upward. And now we can swing this around and select each of these parabolas that we just swept upwards. And we can mirror them about z equals zero. So we're going to say about z equals zero, and let's just make sure that we're picking that correctly. And we're going to say OK. And now we have a complete hyperbolic paraboloid, which looks like this in three dimensions, or if we rotate it down, we see that it's a series of squares within one larger square. And that's not surprising when you think about it because every one of those parabolas was established in a vertical plane and when we project all of them down on a horizontal plane, each of those vertical planes will intersect the horizontal plane in a single line. And because of the way we set it up, those, are, those lines are all going to either be parallel or perpendicular to each other. So there is the hyperbolic paraboloid surface. And by the way, one of the beauties to uh, something like this is that a parabola scales. So y equals kx squared or y equals kz squared. Uh, k is just a constant of proportionality. And if we rescale the y values, we're just basically changing that constant of proportionality. So if I came in here and I said, I want to rescale this. So I click rescale and I can change y by a 0.5 factor. Um, it's still a parabola, it's just shallower, and the highest point now, instead of being 16 feet, is um, 8 feet. So y is equal to a. The first number is x, then y, then z. Um, for the moment, though, to just keep this easy to visualize, we're going to leave it at the scale that we had it at. Okay, now we know how to generate a hyperbolic paraboloid. The one thing we haven't verified yet is the whole issue of how important it is to triangulate the surface of this. We know that as we try to deal with roll through buckling, there's going to be a tendency of these vertical elements to move relative to each other. In other words, all these quadrilateral shapes are going to try and elongate and become parallelograms, or they're going to be stressed or stretched on the diagonals or compressed on the diagonals. In order to get all of those working together as a continuous surface, we need to triangulate it. So here we have a hyperbolic paraboloid vault with no triangulation. Here we have the, hyperbolic, the same hyperbolic vault with triangulation. The key thing is that these triangulating elements are tension elements and they have very small cross sections. So there's relatively little material involved. But as we're going to see shortly, the importance of those elements is profound. And again, just to make sure that you see the shapes of these things, I'm going to go through and rotate this around. So on the left, we have the untriangulated uh, hyperbolic paraboloid. And on the right, right here, we have the triangulated hyperbolic paraboloid. So now we're going to look at results of some of the simulations. This shows the frame. Um, and let me go find my multi-frame file here. 
All right, so here we have the two, and we're going to go to the uh, plot window, and you'll notice that under an asymmetric load, we're exhibiting a substantial amount of roll-through deformation. So this is the original shape of the vault, and now it has begun to dish out on this side where the wind overpressure is and to bulge outward where the wind suction is. And all the um, deformations shown in this diagram are pretty drastically uh, exaggerated for visualization purposes. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we can see for comparison that the deformation of the untriangulated hyperbolic paraboloid is severe compared to the deformation of the triangulated hyperbolic paraboloid. So what we're going to make is a declaration that says unless these are very thick members that are rigidly framed together or unless they're triangulated, we are probably not getting the maximum benefit of this double curvature uh, because there's enough shear lag or rubberiness within the surface of this shape that we're going to see fairly substantial uh, deformations uh, under asymmetric loads. So now, having said that, we're going to go and compare a barrel vault that's triangulated with a hyperbolic paraboloid vault that's triangulated, and we can now demonstrate the importance of um, the shape in terms of resisting deformation. So we're going to go to the plot window and we're going to look at um, the correct load case. In this case it's asymmetric snow load and we're going to look at the deformation and of course this is exaggerated to such a degree that uh, it's bordering on absurd so we're going to tone that down a little bit um, just scale back the deformations. So here you see the deflection and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to render it and you see that compared to this hyperbolic paraboloid vault which has been triangulated by the way this barrel vault is showing extreme deformations. You can barely detect any deflection in the hyperbolic paraboloid vault but very extreme variations or deflections in the barrel, the simple barrel vault, the, the vault with no double curvature. So this is the original shape and it has deformed down to here and the red indicates so in this zone we have some red and in that zone we have some red and just to demonstrate that point we're going to zoom in. So we have severe stresses here and severe stresses there but when we go back and look, we see everything here is in blue. In other words, it's down near this, this end of the spectrum. So this vault is, is not only very stiff and is resisting deformations, but it's also much, much stronger because at this uh, point, the stresses within that vault are relatively small compared to what we're observing in this barrel vault. So adding double curvature to this vault has substantially improved its performance compared to a simple barrel vault. This ends our first video on hyperbolic paraboloid vaults.